We begin our Savior's divine service this evening in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We continue with him 357. this evening. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Let us pray. Almighty God, merciful Father, we are sinful by nature and have sinned against you in our thoughts, words, and actions. But we are sorry for our transgressions and pray you of your bountiful mercy to be gracious and merciful unto us. Forgive us for Jesus' sake. Renew us by your spirit and lead us in the way everlasting. Jesus Christ is the satisfactory payment for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. We are forgiven. With boldness and confidence, we may approach the throne to find grace to help in time of need. In the peace of Christ's forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Let us join hearts in prayer.
Lord of all power and might, you are the author and giver of all good things. Graft into our hearts the love of your word. Increase in us true faith. Nourish us with all goodness. And of your great mercy, keep us in the same. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Congregation may be seated for our readings. Our first scripture reading for this, the eighth Sunday after Pentecost, is found recorded in the Old Testament book of 1 Kings, chapter 3, verses 5 through 15. We see how Solomon received his great wisdom. God had offered to give the young king whatever he asked for. Solomon could have asked for a long life, riches, revenge on his enemies, to have a great and powerful kingdom. But instead he asked for wisdom, to be able to govern God's people and to distinguish between right and wrong with God's blessings. And Solomon became the wisest man who ever lived. We read God's word. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask, what shall I give you? And Solomon said, You have shown great mercy to your servant David, my father, because he walked before you in truth, in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart with you. You have continued this great kindness for him, and you have given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. Now, O Lord, my God, you have made your servant king instead of my father David, but I am a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to be numbered or counted. Therefore, give to your servant an understanding heart to judge your people, that I may discern between good and evil, for who is able to judge this great people of yours? The speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. Then God said to him, because you have asked this thing and have not asked long life for yourself, nor have asked riches for yourself, nor have asked the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern justice, behold, I have done according to your words. See, I have given you a wise and understanding heart so that there has not been anyone like you before you, nor shall any like you arise after you. And I have also given you what you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that there shall not be anyone like you among the kings all your days. So, if you walk in my ways to keep my statutes and my commandments as your father David walked, and I will lengthen your days. Then Solomon awoke, and indeed it had been a dream, and he came to Jerusalem and stood before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, offered up burnt offerings, offered peace offerings, and made a feast for all his servants. So far, first reading. At this time we ask the Vacation Bible School children to come forward to sing their hymn, I Am Jesus' Little Lamb.
Our second reading this evening is found recorded in Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 8, verses 29 to, 28 to 39. What a great comfort we have as Christians in the midst of the sufferings and trials of life. All things God will work together for my eternal good as a believer in Christ. All things. That's why we are more than conquerors through Christ. For nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We read God's word. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. In whom he justified, these he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long, we are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So far, second meeting. Let's rise and join together in confessing our Christian faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Congregation may be seated. We'll continue with hymn 347.
grace and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for this evening's meditation and application to our daily faith life is found recorded in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 13, verses 44 to 52. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid, and for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet that was cast into the sea and gathered some of every kind, which when it was full, they drew near to, drew to shore, and they sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but threw the bad away. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth, separate the wicked from among the just, and cast them into the furnace of fire. There'll be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Jesus said to them, have you understood all these things? They said to him, yes, Lord. Then he said to them, therefore every scribe instructed concerning the kingdom of heaven is like a householder who brings out of his treasure things new and old. So far, our sermon text. In Christ Jesus, who is the greatest treasure sent from our Heavenly Father to all of mankind, dear fellow redeemed, what would you count as your most prized possession? Sometimes prized possessions change with age. When I was about eight years old, my most prized possession was a baseball signed by my baseball heroes, the Milwaukee Braves. Hank Aaron, Eddie Matthews, Warren Spahn, Lou Burdette. When I was in college, my prized possession was my first car, a 1961 Chevy Nova. Prized possessions can range from souped up sports cars, to gun collections, to jewelry, to grandmother's wedding dress. And what makes these prized possessions can be from whom they came, who or what they remind us of, or the value of the object itself. And all three of those things we find in our sermon text this evening, which leads us to our theme, which is the most prized possession in our life is the gospel. The good news of Jesus Christ suffering death and resurrection for us is the most precious and priceless because of whom it came from, God. Because of whom and what it reminds us of, of Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross for us and of its value. Forgiveness, life, and salvation, which is far more valuable than all the gold and all the silver in the world. This evening we are going to be discussing three parables. The first two direct our attention to the value of the gospel and also the effect it has on the believers. The gospel is the most precious treasure we have. The third one is a parable concerning the last day. The gathering together of all people for the last judgment, warning unbelievers against hypocrisy, and warning us believers against just simply going through the motions of Christianity. And at the very end of our text, there's what we call maybe a, a little mini parable that talks about the purpose and effect of training in God's eyes and how it applies to all of us. So as I said, our theme this morning is this, the gospel is your greatest treasure. And I would suspect that all of us here this evening would agree with that statement. But how often do our lives show agreement with that statement? 
The gospel of Jesus Christ is to be the most precious, the greatest treasure that we have. But it's not if we don't come consistently to hear it preached. It's not if we neglect it laying there on our shelves, unopened and closed. It's not if we don't come to hear it and study it in Bible class, in Sunday school, confirmation, Christian day school. It's not if we don't speak it to other people and tell them the contents of that gospel message for them to be saved. It's not if we don't give our offerings so that the word of God can be spread all around the world. So let's look at our first two texts and see how the Lord says that this gospel message is so precious to us and the effect it has on us. We read again verse 44. Jesus is speaking and he says, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which a man found and hid, and for joy over it he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. The man who found that treasure realized the value of it. So he sold everything he had to buy that field and secure that treasure. That treasure was the most important thing in his life. And that's what the gospel is, too. The gospel should be our greatest treasure. Nothing is more precious. Nothing can be more valuable to a person who is weighed down with his sins, who has a heart that is suffering because of his sins, and he hears that good news, son, daughter, be of good cheer. Your sins are all forgiven you. When we're confronted with the horror of our sins, and we realize the just judgment of damnation that we deserve, and we realize the selfishness of our actions and our thoughts and our words, and so very often the closest to us, the ones we love the most, we hurt the worst, and realize that God has all the right in the world to say to us sinners, go to hell. Depart from me. And yet then we hear God the Father say to us, I love you so much. I'm going to send my son into this world to go to hell for you, to be condemned for you, to pay for your guilt and your punishment, so that that relationship that was broken by Adam and Eve will be made together again and be a perfect relationship between you and me. What greater treasure can there ever be? I, a selfish, self-centered, condemned sinner, have been set free. I have been redeemed. I have been justified. That message will become the foundation to my life, the most important thing in my life. The appreciation and knowledge of that forgiveness, life, and salvation will control and dominate our entire lives. The second parable is similar. A merchant is going and he's looking for pearls. He finds the most exquisite, the most priceless pearl, and he sells everything he has to buy that pearl. That pearl is the most important thing in his life. When Adam and Eve fell into sin, and generations after them were conceived and born in sin, people realized that there was an emptiness in their lives. They were separated from the Lord God who had created them. There was something lacking in their lives. The natural knowledge of God that is in all of us and our conscience leads us to realize that we're accountable to someone, and we owe a debt to that someone out there. And that is why, throughout every era of time, all around the globe, people worship God or gods. One philosopher wrote, if there were no God, man would invent one. And that is indeed 
what unbelieving mankind has been doing for thousands of years, creating hundreds if not thousands of gods that he has to appease, make him feel sorry for him, or feel kindly towards him because he knows he's done wrong. Even today, mainline Christian denominations have gone spiritually bankrupt because they don't look upon the Bible as the sole source of the authority, divine authority from God, and instead rely upon their wisdom, their philosophy, their intellect. And what has taken the place, in the case of many people, Eastern religions, cults, other beliefs that claim to have divine authority and will fill that emptiness in your life. Others know they have an emptiness, and so they fill it with material things. But there are many who realize the futility of that, and so they fill the, feel their emptiness with the religion of works, social activism. But none of that can fill that emptiness, that void that we feel when we're separated from God. Only when the Holy Spirit creates faith in our hearts to believe in Jesus Christ and have that perfect, loving relationship with our Heavenly Father can we feel complete. If any of you know someone who has lived most of their life in unbelief, apart from Jesus as their Lord and Savior, not knowing our loving Heavenly Father, and then were brought to faith later in their life, you will hear them say, that there was an emptiness they felt all their life, but they didn't know what it was. And now it is filled, and they have stopped their search because they know now who God is and what he has done for them. That precious gospel, the good news of forgiveness, life, and salvation has filled that emptiness because God the Father has done such great things in Jesus. And that peace, that joy can be found nowhere else but in the good news of Christ. This message of salvation makes every other message pale in comparison. It is indeed that pearl of great price. Being led to find that great pearl by the power of the Holy Spirit, in other words, believing in Jesus, is a life-changing experience that puts everything else in our lives in proper perspective. And so our sermon this evening, our text, is leading us to realize the treasure that we all have in the Word of God, in our homes, in our church, in our Christian day school, in our hearts, and to make use of our time of grace, to hear it consistently, to read it often, to study it, to learn it, to meditate on it, to make it our daily companion. The third parable shows us the results of possessing that treasure. We read in verses 47 to 50. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet that was cast into the sea and gathered some, some of every kind which when it was full, they drew to shore, and they sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but threw the bad away, so that it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth, separate the wicked from the among the just, and cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. People of Galilee knew exactly what Jesus was talking about with this net. Fishermen would go out with their boats, take these huge nets, cast them over the boat, they hit the water, they sink to the bottom, and they'd pull the net up and catch all the fish in that area, even the fish they didn't want to catch. And so when they pulled the net up, they'd either there in the boat or take it to shore, separate all the fish, the good from the bad, the edible from the inedible, the ones that could sell at the market and the ones that were useless and worthless. The meaning to this parable is that net is the gospel. And it's cast out into this world when you preach the good news, and it catches people within its net. But sometimes it catches people that have heard or been touched with the gospel who don't really believe the gospel. In Christian congregations, there may be people who don't believe, but they are hypocrites. 
pretend believers who are like bad fish whom God despises because they are still dead spiritually and lost in their sins. What a warning this parable is to every single one of us here this evening, not to be Sunday morning Christians only, or I suppose we'd say here in final like Saturday night Christians only, and then the rest of the week live like we don't know Jesus, don't know about his forgiveness or about his will. Or make-believe Christians come to church because we want to look good in the eyes of others, but we have no heart for Jesus, no true repentance from the heart or trust in Jesus. Is our Christianity a sham, our repentance hollow, our faith and our trust insincere? Jesus is saying in this parable on Judgment Day, all of that is exposed. Jesus will see and separate the believers from the unbelievers, just like the fishermen separate the good fish from the bad fish. And the bad fish, the unbelievers, will be cast in the furnace of fire into the outer darkness while they'll be weeping and wailing of teeth, gnashing of teeth. Make no mistake about it. This place called hell exists through all eternity. May the gospel message lead us to use our time of grace so that that gospel message that shows us salvation and everlasting life is the constant companion in our heart. When Jesus was done telling these parables, he turned to his disciples and he asked them, have you understood all these things? Remember the reason for parables? Jesus said he told parables to his believers so they could know about the kingdom of heaven. But the same parable would conceal and hide the truth of the kingdom of heaven to his enemies, to those who didn't believe him. So Jesus now asked his disciples, did you understand all these things? And they said, yes, they did. So then Jesus says one more little mini parable to them in verse 52. Therefore, every scribe instructed concerning the kingdom of heaven is like a householder who brings out of his treasure things new and old. Do you know what Jesus is meaning? What's he meaning by that little parable there? Do you understand that? Let's read it again. Therefore, every scribe, every teacher, instructed concerning the kingdom of heaven is like a householder who brings out of his treasure things new and old. The Jewish leaders of Jesus' day were not well equipped. They were more important, they were more concerned about saying what they wanted to say than what God wanted to say. They were more concerned about teaching laws, regulations, and ceremonial things than forgiveness and grace to the coming Messiah. The disciples were being well trained. They were not only trained in the Old Testament promises concerning the Messiah, but they were walking and talking with the fulfillment of those promises, Jesus himself. They were hearing things and seeing things that no one had ever heard or seen before, and they were being prepared to dip into that storehouse of the treasure of the gospel to be able to bring things out that were both new and old to other people. And the Lord is doing the same thing for all of you. We have that precious book, the Bible, the Old Testament, and the New Testament. And through his word, Jesus fills our hearts to understand and know how we've been saved, what God says in his word, so that we too as householders can go into that treasure and bring things out new and old and apply them to the hearts of others. Whatever Jesus lays before us, maybe at work, Maybe at play, at school, and someone says, oh, I got this problem, and you can reach back into the storehouse of the treasure of the gospel and apply God's word to your friend, to your neighbor, to your spouse, to your children, to yourself. By the time I got to college, that precious baseball of mine, the ink on it, on it was so faded, I couldn't even read the names. 
of those baseball heroes of mine. And so I lost that ball. I don't know when I lost it. And that precious 1961 Chevy Nova that started every single winter day in Eau Claire, eventually got old. I sold it. It rusted away. So much for worldly, precious treasures. But the same word that I heard when I was eight years old, and the same word that I heard and learned and studied when I was in college, is the same word that I hear and read today. It is that treasure that has led me and my children and my grandchildren to faith in Jesus. And it is that same treasure that has been laid upon every one of your hearts as well and has led you to believe in Jesus Christ. And it's your greatest treasure in your life and in your death. As disciples of Jesus, may we be eager to read and study and hear that word of God so we learn more and more about our Savior and can reach back into that treasure, into the storehouses of God's word, and bring forth things new and old to lay upon the hearts of those whom we meet and those whom we love. Christian training in God's word prepares us to share that gospel message with others. God's word, a treasure is to me. Through sorrow's night, my son shall be the shield of faith in battle. The father's hand has written there my title as his child and heir, the kingdom's thine forever. That promise faileth never. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding will keep your hearts and minds centered in our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We'll continue with the next hymn, which is hymn 430, which is 1 through 4 and 7 and 8.
thankful hearts will now be received. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, once again we have enjoyed the privilege of gathering in this house of worship to hear your holy and precious word. May its message of salvation through Christ stir up our hearts to faith and love and produce the full fruits of good works in our lives. May we not forget your word, which we have heard, or bring shame upon it by our lips speaking against it, our hearts not believing it, or our lives not obeying it. Keep your words in the minds and hearts of our loved ones not present with us this evening, and return them soon to fellowship with us. Through the Spirit, open the Scriptures more and more to our understanding, that we might know you better, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent to save us. Now, Father, we greatly need the comfort your word brings us, for we are by nature sinful, and our flesh is continually opposed to your will. We often find that we act against your commandments, doing the very things you forbid, neglecting to do the things that you command. We justly deserve eternal separation from you in hell. But we plead your love and mercy, which is revealed to this world of sinners in your precious word. Oh, let the blood of Jesus Christ, your Son, blot our sins from your memory and present us faultless before you. Our only plea is that you forgive us for his sake. There is nothing that we desire more than eternal life through his mercies and mediation. Father, from your word, we know that your heavenly throne is a throne of grace and that Jesus, our Savior, intercedes for us there. And so to it we come, burdened with our worries, our cares, our needs, our sorrows, our troubles, and our illnesses. Fold us to your bosom, and by your counsel and aid, relieve us of our many burdens according to your will. We know you are a God so gracious and merciful, so near us when we pray, and so quick to respond to our pleas. Why then should we be fearful or anxious or worried about our future? O oh, Father, according to your own promise, bless us now and always for Jesus' sake, in whose name we join together in praying the confident prayer he taught us to pray. Our Father, 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Receive a believing hearts the blessing of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give to you his peace. Amen. Amen. Be seated for our last hymn. privilege and joy of mine to be able to serve you as your vacancy pastor during this time of need. It's also a joy that we know that the Lord has fulfilled and filled your need with the answer from Pastor Sowers. And uh, this Wednesday we'll be having our church council meeting. Pastor Sowers is going to be Skyping with us and we'll be getting more details as to when he'll be installed and so forth. So this week we have church, uh, we're, um, church council meeting on Wednesday at 6.30. Reminder to all the voters. Quarterly voters meeting will be held at 5 o'clock on Saturday prior to our service. Service is at 6.30, and if the quarterly meeting is not done, we'll continue with it after the service. Are there any other announcements that need to be given at this time? If there are any guests and visitors here, please sign the guest register as you leave. Thank you. <laughs> 